Okay, I know that there are probably a lot of questions. My inclination is to take three questions at a time since we do have to wrap this up uh, on the half hour today. Um, one question there, please identify yourself and uh, state your question briefly. Thank you. Natalia Jensen, uh, BBC Ukrainian and Canon Institute. Uh, speaking on the authoritarian tendencies, don't you think that uh, what Yanukovych is building is quite shaky? Because um, uh, some people say, some experts say that in order to have authoritarian regime, Russian way, he lacks and personal charisma, no ideology, his uh, support is diminishing, the Ukrainian society doesn't support it. Uh, do you think that the regime is what he is building, this authoritarian tendency, quite uh, undermines itself? And which factors could actually help? to undermine it. Are, are they more in, inside or outside? Uh, Do we have a second question? Um, second and third. Uh, yes, well first I do want to thank you for make, taking time uh, to have this discussion sure. and I think actually it's very timely and I'm glad we, yeah. we waited uh, because uh, not only to get sort of the second level of reaction to the report but I also think what's important uh, is that this not be a static report. Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly since you've made recommendations, and I think uh, this could be a blueprint you know, to follow um, to see how things are progressing. But I'm interested in, in um, your discussions with the Europeans since the now the PC uh, strategy is that we're supporting Ukraine's European integration. And so I think uh, certainly the European Union ha needs to be in the leadership role and Whatever we do is can be maybe classified as a supporting role or however we want to characterize it. So, uh, have you been making similar, dis uh, taking similar discussions in the EU, and are you finding receptive audiences and and people willing to take some action on your report? Okay, third question. Uh, Ivan Gardia, the Ukrainian American Coordinating Council. <coughs> this is sort of continuation of what Nadia just said. I think. Uh, this report, as uh, Dr. Kreviv pointed out, is not only valuable for Ukraine, but especially uh, valuable perhaps for the uh, United States and the rest of the world. My question is, do you feel that the, this, the growing disinterest in Ukraine by the United States and by Western European countries is really uh, due to the uh, policies of the new government? Or is it simply that they are not interested anymore because of the many critical issues uh, in the world today and are using this as an excuse to not be fully engaged with Ukraine? Sure, maybe I'll pick up a couple of them. Sure, sure. Let me pick up. Uh, first, I welcome the comment about having this as not static, it's a blueprint. Yep. Um, on the European side, it's actually quite interesting, it's quite complicated. On the one hand, um, the Europeans have responded quite well in terms of saying, okay, we need to be serious about working with Ukraine moving forward. They've prioritized negotiations on the association agreement. They're actually making significant progress on these negotiations and the uh, deep and concert free, uh, comprehensive free trade agreement. Ukraine itself, under pressure from Moscow, has said no to customs union with Ukraine and Ka with Kazakhstan and uh, with uh, Russia and Belarus. We're, we're, we're putting our priority on the EU side. So on the one hand, you can look at this and say, okay, we've got a group that's quite positive, and the bureaucracy has taken, the trajectory is moving, the bureaucracy is moving, and this is very positive for laying some of the grooves from the long-term uh, posts that can help sort of anchor Ukraine and Europe and guide Ukraine towards Europe. At the same time, I've had discussions quite recently with quite a, uh, political level actors in Europe above the fray of the negotiations and the, e and the Brussels bureaucracy, and the political actors are saying increasingly, hmm, we can't leave this on autopilot. Uh, they're particularly alarmed because they see what's happening to the former Prime Minister Tymoshenko and are starting to question, um, maybe we need to actually be far more conditional, stringent, uh, before we even uh, allow their conclusions to, to move forward with the association agreement. It's a very difficult issue because on the one hand, we want Europe to make available visas to have stronger, free tr have stronger trade ties to Ukraine. We want the things that help uh, with the Europeanization of the Ukrainian population, economy, political system. Um, but you don't want Europe's carrots to be out there for free while the government is playing nicely on one side and taking the political opposition and ensuring that they can't actually run against them in the next elections on the other side. 
So that debate's brewing, it's growing, where at the bureaucratic level, the EU is in a positive groove of negotiations. Increasingly, politically, it's starting to question whether it needs to rein back a little bit to put some more pressure on the government. On the growing disinterest part, I think your question is quite astute. Um, and frankly, I think they're mutually reinforcing. Uh, the United States has a very heavy agenda, whether it's domestic issues, the budget, not to mention what's happening internationally. We're dealing with the rise of, of China and India. We've, we're dealing with the, how to manage drawdowns in Iraq, Afghanistan. We've got another controversial intervention war taking place in Libya. The administration has its hands full in some respects. Uh, so this is not at naturally at the top of the agenda. If you look at European policy, Russia reset is at the top of the agenda, not necessarily Ukraine uh, and its integration prospects. At the same time, you have a, a worrying trend of difficult actions, messy actions, unhelpful actions by the Ukrainian authorities only reinforce the, the ability of decision makers here to say, why is it actually worth my limited attention priorities time to invest in Kyiv, to invest in Ukraine, if these guys are going off and doing X, Y, and Z? It's a mutually reinforcing dynamic. So what we tried to aim at with our report was we didn't run our report to give folks in our former positions or in other positions the right to say, ah, Ukraine's a mess, it's just not worth my time right now. We tried to say actually a little bit of the attention and time actually can have an impact here. And it merits that, that renewed attention. Let me leave the authoritarian to this. Yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, it, look, actually, let me pick up on, on the last point Damon was making, which is um, think back to last April when Viktor Yanukovych came for the Nuclear Security Summit and he brought a, a prize for the president. It was very smart on his part. Um, and think of the other time that the president last year spoke out on Ukraine through a statement in December while he was on vacation in Hawaii, and that's when Ukraine transferred HEU to Russia. Um, there were no other statements in the president's name coming out on Ukraine. The vice president um, it took some lead on this and, and had done good work on Ukraine. But when it comes to the president's level, it's HEU, and I think that has sent a signal that's where the president's interests are in these security, not liberation issues, and not really on the domestic situation inside the country. I don't think that's the right message to send, but I think that's where we are in, in reality. Um, on, on, just very quickly, and then I'll come to Natalia's question. Uh, our Freedom House's uh, Nations in Transit report is being rolled out next week. This covers the former Soviet Union and Central Eastern Europe, um, and we're rolling it out in London and Brussels on Monday and Tuesday, and I'll uh, be there for that, and we'll certainly focus on Ukraine, so another opportunity to uh, re reinforce the, the messages and the conclusions we have on the Ukraine report. On, uh, on your question, Talia, um, it's shaky on the one hand, and in part you put your finger on, on how to measure the shakiness, and that is the declining support for Yanukovych. Um, it's plummeted. And, uh, it, it, and you see his numbers going down, Yulia's numbers going up, although not skyrocketing. Uh, but they're turning her into a martyr in certain respects. And, and some people in the government would even acknowledge that. And yet, again, they just can't seem to stop digging this hole. <laughs> Um, and so it's shaky on the one hand, and you do see some protests and demonstrations, and you see the government trying to block uh, people's ability to assemble and conduct these protests. But I'm not sure how fragile it is, um, and in part because we, we had this discussion when we rolled out the report in April, in 2004, people went out in the streets to protest against something, but they also went out to protest for something, uh, for, for Yushinka and what he represented with the Orange Movement. I don't think you'd have that now. Sure, they, they might go out and protest against what the government's doing. I don't think you're going to have many people going out and protesting for. And, and that's one of the, I think, depressing parts we found. And again, Damon's absolutely right. We don't want to paint a hopeless picture here. But there, there is a depressing element to it. The depressing element, it, it comes back to some of the conclusions I mentioned, which is the opposition isn't giving civil society and the people at large a lot of reason to go out and rally. Um, they, they've been there, done that, with the Orange leaders for five years, and what a disaster that was. Endless bickering, 
um, corruption, the gas deal in January 2006 was probably one of the lowest points. Um, and, you know, that gas deal wasn't signed by Victor Yanukovych. It actually also wasn't signed by Yulia Tymoshenko. Um, and uh, so, so I think there, there is this dispirited, disillusioned nature that means the regime, while not as strong as it may appear, isn't on the verge of collapsing either. Um, it, it, but but it, it, they need some new blood out there. I don't see where it's coming from. Because some of these opposition leaders aren't old. Uh, I mean, you know, you look at, what's that? Old thinking. Old thinking. Fair enough. Uh, but, uh, you know, when it comes to the uh, actuarial tables, um, they're, they're doing okay. Uh, so uh, we'll have like to see. Okay, we, we need to keep questions Sorry. brief. We'll, have, we'll try uh, to keep answers brief. Uh, <laughs> oh, one question there. Please okay. identify yourself and the second one. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask what you're, you're saying of the, the plummeting of the actually the attitude right now, the receptivity of the Yanukovych uh, regime right now in Ukraine itself. Did you have an opportunity to sense that plummeting effect in Eastern Ukraine? There were some reports that were issued even in the last couple of days on, on Luhansk and Luhansk attitudes of the people. And it looks like it's a drastic fall to it. We've also heard uh, certainly oral and written uh, reports on similarities in Zaporizhia as well as in, in, in Donetsk. Did you have a chance to get closer to that uh, Eastern objection to where Yanukovych is taking Ukraine? Along with that, can that negativity towards Yanukovych be transformed into the positive, some sort of a positive message, as you had, Dave, mentioned, that that's, that's something that's missing in any type of actions in the, in the near future? Okay. Okay. <laughs> second, second question here, and I'm saving the third one for myself, and then. You know. <laughs> okay. Andrei Tinsuk, I'm a CS Ukraine Business Council. Uh, my my question is: uh, recently, in a recent uh, PBS interview, uh, Foreign Minister Rishenko made a comment uh, about uh, slapping persecution, and uh, in his exact words, he said, "We need to start from the top. You cannot start with taxi driver." And uh, co commenting on agenda to fight corruption in Ukraine, uh, and another thing, in a country which doesn't have a strong rule of law and adequate legal framework to determine powers for government officials, uh, do you think Yanukovych administration is setting a precedent uh, and demonstrating that government officials, including the former pr former prime minister, uh, prime minister, they are not immune to to justice? Do you think? It, it also may exist fear that uh, come next opposition come if opposition comes to power, come next administration, Yanukovych officials may be follow the president. Should all presidents and prime ministers be watching their backs? <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, third, third question goes to me, and this will be the last question. Um, I'd like to take this maybe a little bit beyond the, um, the actual report, but just looking at Ukraine as a whole and sort of tying it a little bit to what's going on in Tunisia and Egypt today. Um, the, the, the people in Egypt, Tunisia, are, they, they've been on the streets, they're um, creating their new governments, um, but we do have the example of, uh, of Ukraine, what happened in Ukraine after people had been on the streets, and then five years later, where, where are we? Um, if you had some sort of quick recommendations, uh, given that you're both experts on Ukraine, what is it that Ukraine could have done, or recommendations that you could extrapolate from the Ukrainian situation, um, that maybe countries like Egypt and Tunisia should be taking into account very carefully now as they move forward with consolidating the gains of their revolution, protests, uh, whatever, whatever that was. So that's the third and final question, and I'll hand it to both of you to... to Very brief, just three tiny questions. Five seconds. <laughs> yes. If he gets it, I get it too. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have to fight that one out. I, just, I don't see Tabachnik on the list. I just wonder, did you make an attempt yes. to meet with Tabachnik? Yeah. Okay. 
All right. What was the point? Handing <laughs> um, over. Right. Right. We could have met him and said, "Where's your resignation?" Um, <laughs> um, you you want me to go? Sure. Okay. sure. Um, let me pick up on the selective prosecutions. And let me be clear, none of us is uh, an advocate for a representative of, of Yulia Tymoshenko. Um, but the cases against, or the whole effort against her does not pass the credibility test. They start with Kyoto, then they go to ambulances, now it's the 2009 gas deal. It's like they're trying to throw things at a dartboard until they hit the bullseye. Um, and you just don't do that if you want a credible judicial process. Um, I think most of them know that, and I think Constantine knows that too, um, that there is a lack of credibility here, and credibility is as important as anything else for a government. Um, and, you know, if they want to really make a mark on no immunity, if you get to the way they handled the Stockholm hearing on Rasu Kroner, the impression is they rolled over. Who rolled over? It cost Ukraine a significant amount of money um, in doing so. Um, and Russell Kroner was back. To me, that's a terrible development. That's one of the most threatening things, I think, for Ukraine's future, is the return of corrupt middlemen companies with links to Russia that have insinuated uh, themselves into the highest ranks of the government. Um, I'd look into that. Um, and, and see what the truth there is before I would uh, be throwing dark boy, uh, darts against Yulia Tymoshenko. Um, it, it, it is equally important that uh, people understand nobody's immune from justice. But elections often are a better vehicle to bring about change than prosecutions. Um, and people didn't like Yulia Tymoshenko. By 3.5%, they preferred Yanukovych. And he won. Um, time to move on. Time to look forward and get Ukraine's economy in a better track than to keep looking back to try to box in op opposition figures so that they might never come back and compete against them. Um, on uh, uh, the lessons, uh, you know, one of the lessons um, I would think you're talking about lessons from Orange Revolution and now. Is post orange post orange post orange revolution right? Um, a parliamentary system, I think, is better, but it doesn't mean. In, in you know, Ukraine had kind of a hybrid because uh, the president's position was fairly important, but the parliament was also important. The Rada blocked a lot of things that Yushchenko did. Now you have the flip side, which is the Rada is essentially a rubber stamp of Yanukovych. Um, I think for regimes that go from an authoritarian system, a parliamentary system is much better so that you avoid the likelihood of one dictator replacing another. So in the case of Egypt or Tunisia, you don't want a Ben Ali or Mubarak Jr. to come in and replace them. Um, or would you want a, a, a Kuchma? Um, and uh, so I, I think parliamentary system, civil society, role of civil society, something that Freedom House is working on in the Middle East, um, is helping civil society stay very active and engaged. Um, those, those are also important lessons. Um, Anything on the East? On the East, East, East. Sure, I think, I think yeah. that. I actually think that I can't answer specifically in terms of how we, I don't have enough data or, or real sense of granularity to know exactly how regions John Cope stand in place out across the East, but your question about the answer was, is key because I think the viability of Ukrainian democracy depends on democracy in the East. Ukrainian democracy shouldn't be the East and the West in a census or a population count. It needs to be competition on the basis of ideas. And one of the things that we were struck by in Kharkiv, where we went, um, competitive political environment. Uh, it was now we actually think the local, local elections there were probably stolen, uh, but it's not it's not total domination. And I think at the end of the day, Ukrainian democracy depends on plurality in the East being a critical element of that democracy. So I think your question brings a lot of insight. I don't have all the analysis to back up sort of where that's going, but 
the Kharkiv indications, despite being disturbing about the outcome, were positive in terms of the organizing forces to a, a stand against a, a, a region's, region's domination. Um, I think on, on Foreign Minister Poshinko's point, the way, uh, Nadia, you put it, should all presidents and prime ministers watch their back? That's one of the most dangerous things happening right now. That's why corruption <laughs> is so corrosive, because corruption lets, corruption pervade, is a pervasive problem. It touches top political folks and governments. They realize that because they have been involved in such schemes, they are potentially vulnerable to prosecution in the future. Therefore, they better not let grasp of the state structures because they're coming after them just the way they're going after the folks out of power. Corruption is at the core of so many problems in Ukraine. It's a national security problem because it allows external forces to be able to manipulate vulnerable Ukrainian politicians. And it undermines Ukrainian democracy because it erodes their faith and their ability to have a life after government. So I just couldn't, couldn't feel more strongly about that. And I think that's why you don't start at the top of the opposition. You start at the top of your friends. Uh, the Tabashnik question you asked was relevant because we didn't go to Ukraine and even think about asking to meet him. It wasn't on our agenda. It grew out organically from our conversations where we came to appreciate how important that position, that role is, how divisive it is, the political implications of it. It was something I frankly learned through, my, uh, through the, the process. So when we put together our t request list, I didn't even think about putting him on the request list. It grew out. I grew out of the analysis. You should have asked us before you were the Exactly. <laughs> you you <laughs> have told me that. This shows you that I was somewhat of a removed analyst on some of this. And then I think your, your very important question, India, because what we're suffering with today is a result of the weak foundation of Ukraine. If the Orange Revolution had played out differently, um, we would be having a fundamentally com different conversation today. So your question is spot on. Yushchenko came to power as part of the Orange Revolution with a vision. He did not come with a plan. And I think if you're looking at Tunisia, Egypt, or you're looking at po leaders post-election, a vision is important to set the trajectory to help drive your country in a direction. I do believe in the value of vision. But if you don't have a plan, and you don't have a team to help you get there, it's useless. And Yushchenko disappointed his people because he came without a plan. He was a disastrous administrator, manager, uh, and it led to a, a, a time of dealing with governance dominated by personal animosity rather than an agenda of transformation and reform. And so that would be one of the lessons I think to take away. How do you couple a vision with an actual plan to govern in an effective and efficient way and deliver at the end of the day what the people of any society need, which is basic services and jobs and opportunity? Um, vision doesn't deliver food on the table at night in a small uh, Nemirov uh, in Ukraine. And I think um, that's a, a key takeaway. The last point I would just say is expectations. Um, revolutions all often bring with them very high expectations. And it is important to try to keep those expectations in check um, because with all the excitement that came with the Arab Spring and the Tahrir Square and, and, and in Tunisia as well, um, reality is set back in. And it's hard to go from systems that have been in place for decades to entirely new structures. And some of these structures are just rotten to the core. And it's going to take time. It'll take generations, perhaps. Um, so we shouldn't expect, um, as we saw in the case of Ukraine, that these countries will go from the regime that they were to a democracy uh, in a year. It just doesn't happen that way. So we're all going to be gainfully employed for some time. I think there's work to be done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I think we have to wrap up now. Uh, thank you, uh, David. Thank you, Damon, for an excellent report, which um, uh, will still be looked at, I'm sure, from many, many months to come for Ukraine and also many years to come in terms of the actual types of issues that you've been looking at. I think it was a very good sort of structured approach to, to, the, uh, to the issue. Thank you to Freedom House for hosting this. Thank you to U.S. Ukraine Foundation for uh, facilitating the, the meeting and um, making it available to a lot more people than, than could make it here today. And thank you all for coming. Thanks very much.